Hello, everyone, and welcome back once again to Viscera Cleanup Detail. And today, the map we're going to be cleaning is Abandoned Asylum. Recently, the video I made on the House of Horrors DLC has gotten quite a bit of attention. I don't know why, but it has reminded me that there were a bunch more mod maps that I wanted to play. Maps that had that horror theme. And I really like that, because I've always felt that this was a very comfy game. Kind of a zen game, so adding the creepy factor to that has been just a match made in heaven. Those of you who have seen the previous two videos I've made on this game have basically already heard the speech I'm about to give. But basically, I find a real satisfaction in taking a space that's in disarray and piece by piece kind of cleaning it up, setting it right, and being able to occasionally look around at my progress. Being able to note the difference between the disheveled areas and what I've been through. And when you add a horror theme on top of that, it just makes it that much more interesting and that much more fun to explore and sort of put together the pieces of what it actually is that we're cleaning up the aftermath of. Now, if we have a look at our briefing, Cool Cat, age 17, once again breaking numerous child labor laws. Uh, brief. We plan on renovating an old asylum. However, all the cleanup crews have abandoned the site. Guess you're on your own, buddy. Oh, it's dark in there. We fitted your belt with a flashlight. Okay, well, at least they've given me a flashlight again, unlike the House of Horrors DLC. Uh, now let's have a look at this, because this doesn't look too dark. Looks like the power is still on in the lobby, at least. Uh, but if we head over here, yeah, it looks like we will start getting into darker and darker territory. And the roars of the condemned souls trapped within still echo throughout these halls. Uh, look at all this mess. Ash on the walls, blood, gore all over the place. What appears to be a sickly green vomit or mucus-like substance. And over here, some kind of... Ugh, moving alien fungal growth. We've got a work cut out for us. Now, I'm pretty sure I was demoted at the end of the orphanage cleanup. Although, I'm sure my company did make enough flipping that place to turn around and get this thing, so... I guess I didn't do that bad of a job. Especially since I am still employed. Uh, once again, I'm the one who has to swoop in and clean up their mess. All the while, probably amusing a lot about horror tropes since this is supposed to be quite a bit longer than the previous one. Well, let's get started. Actually, mm, tell you what. The mistake that I've been making for the past two videos has been walking through all this stuff and just tracking it everywhere constantly because I'm leaving so many squishy squishables on the ground for me to track through. So let's do the smart thing, not even worry about what a mess we're making, and just explore around to try and figure out how we're actually going to get through here so that we can eliminate all the squishies first and then start mopping. Okay, just how horror-oriented is this going to be? Because I definitely hear some raspy, groany breathing from in there. Is it you? Oh, you're pick up a ball. This isn't a haunting. This is something else altogether. Aliens or biological experiments gone wrong, taking all bets. Oh, these cages suggest biological experimentation, maybe using the patients as test subjects. We do have the ability to open these doors. Oh, what an absolute mess. Okay, if there's gonna be something roaming these halls trying to eat me, I need to know that right now. I also, before I confront it, need to know where the furnace is, which I can shuck that monster into in the final act, when I become the final girl. 
Yes, definitely torturous experiments going on here. Did you hear that? Okay. I was maybe too quick to dismiss the paranormal angle. We might actually be dealing with alien ghosts. Ugh. That was not the right time to kick a piece of debris startling me. In fact, that would be a very good time to spring another jump scare on me, don't you think? Oh, look at that. Hard to know who the bad guys are here. Is it the alien ghosts or is it the scientists who inflicted this on them? Uh, we have ourselves a shovel. Maybe we can use it to dig up that mound right there. Certain levels do have custom uh, tools that we can pick up. Oh, wow, this place is huge. And the blood of the victims still drips from the pipes. Maybe someone was slammed against the ceiling, or maybe it flows through. Okay, this brings us back around to here. Have to have a very good idea of the place before we can start cleaning it up in any meaningful way. Ugh. Save us. Uh, not my job, I'm afraid. Can we jump up on you? No, we gotta walk around. The floor is definitely lava here. Did I miss something? Was I supposed to have encountered something just now? I have a habit of missing that. I have a habit of looking in just the wrong direction. Oh, no! We're doing the House of Horror thing. We're combining plot elements. A satanic ritual? Maybe that's how we... Those footsteps weren't mine. There were many, many times more footsteps than the ones I was making. Uh, we can't read these. Those aren't notes. Yet another portal to H-E double hockey sticks. And now it goes wherever we want. Which means we don't have to feel bad about doing stuff like this. Also, thank you very much uh, after the House of Horror DLC for telling me that you can, in fact, throw things. That's going to save me a lot of aggravation, I think. But even after coming all the way around, we still... Oh, this opens up. Okay, so now we have access to buckets with which to clean our mop. Can we knock this down at all? Hang on. Let's select our... Come on. Select... Do we have that mop broom thing? We have to be able to hit this to knock it down, right? There's got to be... Oh, that is so annoying that it's right there. But I guess we are just... Got to work with what we got to work with. Oh, and now this opens. Okay, so that's kind of cool. So it seems like this level, sort of by design, forces you to walk all around and see as much as you can. We've got our bucket dispenser right here. We've got our furnace is the is the portal. But I still think there might be a little bit more. There might be some paths that I did not turn down. Such as right here, yes. Because we also haven't found a dispenser. I am so glad to have a flashlight here. On previous maps, it's been so hard to see some of those stains that we needed to clean. It smells all. Oh, you're talking about the sniffer. Which I only now realize that little scanny bit on the end is a trunk. <laughs> That's kind of funny. How many years I've been playing this game? Uh, at least they let you bring snacks. There was a definitive change in atmosphere the moment I stepped inside there. Uh, 
I'm seeing stuff on the ground. Are we able to get into this place? Doesn't seem so. I hope that stuff doesn't count towards my score. Uh, knowing my company, I'm sure it will. More drippy, drippy pipes. Hopefully I can do something about that. And if we come over here... This side does also open. So we can get full connectivity. Excellent. Now, I'm not actually seeing any corpses or bodies on this map. Nor am I seeing a dispenser that we can use to get, like, buckets and stuff for all the little small pieces. I suppose we could maybe use these garbage cans as makeshift ones. But that'll be a little bit annoying. Is there something I'm maybe missing? I think we go grab the shovel and dig that thing up. Since we're not finding any bodies, though, it does sort of raise the question of... What will the squishies be? And the answer is me. I'm going to be a squishy. Oh, who am I kidding? I am squishy. All right, let's pick this up. What are we going to find? Also, is there anywhere we can deposit this dirt? I gotta say, I haven't seen this mechanic in the base game. Is this something that's just modded? Uh, but we are uncovering something. What's it gonna be? Chief Darwin! You ran away from the previous job. Come on, we'll put you back where you belong. Now I mean it. Don't run off again. Just wait for me back at the office. Come on. I know you want to stay and watch me work, but uh, I got stuff to do today. So what have we got? We've got alien... Mutant hybrid experimentation, uh, satanic ritual, ghosts, alien ghosts, and built on an ancient Indian burial ground. So we've got that going for us. Oh, and it was also Halloween. So they were pretty much asking for it, is what I'm hearing. Uh, well, obviously we're going to want a bunch of buckets. We're going to want to spawn a ton of these early on. But I'm not going to start mopping up just yet. We want to... Remove any squishables that may be here. I'm actually a little surprised that we don't get a dispenser for other things. Also, I'm not sure if every map has uh, jibs coming through the disposers. Because I think in the orphanage it never happened, right? Or at least very rarely, certainly at a lower rate than the House of Horror. Let's just keep one right here next to the thing. And before I really get going, I'm going to start moving some of the things that look like they may be squishy. So, definitely starting us off with these things right here. Uh, how many of you can we fit inside a garbage can? There's one over... Oh, there's the dispenser! Okay, so we do have that. And we're not even going to worry too much about stepping and stuff. We're just going to take you... Ugh like a larva or an egg sac or something. You're actually kind of big. You're actually really, really big, so I don't know how many of you we can stack. Probably two at most, right? Yeah, and we're just going to slowly carry you down the hall to that disposer. Actually, it'll for future reference, it'll probably be easier to go out past the bucket dispenser. And oh! And we really don't want to trip on the debris on the ground. That's another thing. All right, whatever these things are, you can have them. Forces of the Underworld. Ugh. Now we'll go back. Yeah, this is definitely the way to go. This is definitely going to be a lot faster, provided we move these out of the way. That's the thing, is that you do sort of settle into routines when you play this. I feel like that's kind of the case with any repetitive job simulator is even if there's not that much to it, you do sort of get good at doing nothing. Which is really interesting in games like this. 
Now two more of these large boyos. Uh, we can turn you. Uh, you're so gross. I feel like this thing wants to attach itself to my face. I would absolutely buy a plush pillow of one, though. And let's stick it in. Come on. Come on. Uh, you're not both going to fit. Okay, well, it looks like you're staying in well enough. Uh, away you go. Oof, I got dangerously close that time. But there shouldn't be a whole lot of problems left. We just got to look around for more of these things and dispose of them as we come across them. Uh, we also have to remember that these trash bags also create stains. So let's get rid of that. I had said last time that I was going to come up with a list of horror tropes to talk about while I play these, but I have not done that. Well, I'll tell you what I did talk about the last couple of times was slasher movies. I talked about certain movies that I like and don't like. I had seen Nightmare on Elm Street for the first time and thought it was much better than expected. Yeah, I don't really tend to care for a lot of the classic 80s slashers. Like, Friday the 13th, the first one is, like, okay, I guess. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street was pretty fun. Halloween is actually my favorite. Of the slasher villains, anyway. Because I feel like with Freddy and Jason, they sort of started leaning more towards comedy. A lot of the 80s movies went that route, and I really don't like it. My favorite is Michael Myers, because even though I don't care for all the movies, his character remained fairly consistent, didn't it? And the interesting thing about Michael Myers is that he has no character. He starts the movie with a history. He's not some unknown killer that's coming onto the scene. And a lot of the fear of him is in... Well, it's in his reputation and what we hear about him secondhand. In other words, a lot of the horror comes from other characters kind of projecting a character onto him. That's really the only characterization he gets is what other people say about him, what other people do in reaction to him. Otherwise, he's might as well be a department store mannequin that stabs people. And I really like that. It's other people's inability to understand a lack of character that is sort of the main driving force of the Halloween movies. And that's a really interesting direction to take it. I like the idea that he was a perfectly normal kid right up until the moment he decided to brutally kill his sister. And then after that, he just sat catatonic for like 30, I think it's like 15 years? Until one day he just decides to start up again. And there's no discernible motive, nothing medically wrong that they can find with him. It's just that fear of the unknown. It's just evil that can't be explained. And the cool thing is, in the tons of movies that they made, it never really deviates from that, except for, apparently, in the one movie that I haven't seen, which is uh, part six, in which apparently this is all part of some, like, cult or whatever. I think that's pretty dumb. I haven't bothered to watch that one, but... My favorite one, actually, is uh, Halloween 4. Like, I know they say, like, these movies always get worse and the first one's the best or whatever. I do like the first one. I think the second one is good, but not as good. Uh, 3 is just kind of largely irrelevant and I don't care about it. My favorite is Halloween 4 because I feel like it's, at its core, the most what this franchise is about. First of all, it has, like, one of the greatest openings ever. The intro to that movie is pure eye candy, just giving us that... There's those footsteps again. Just giving us these incredible, like, grainy, orange, like, filmic Halloween images while that eerie music plays. I adore it. And then the rest of the movie is all about just the fear of Michael Myers is back in town. I feel like that's always the biggest thing in those movies, is seeing everyone else's reactions to the fact that this notorious killer may be back. In the first one, it's hearing the way Loomis talks about him, how nobody's really worried at first, and Loomis is basically just like, you have no idea what you're dealing with. One of my favorite parts of the second movie is when they're trying to figure out, like, okay, he's on the loose, where might he be? And they're thinking, okay, uh, his childhood home, let's go try there. 
and they get there and there's already like a huge lynch mob in front of the house and it just goes to show like just how deep the impression it left on this community I will, however, say that uh, I love Loomis as a character, but the guy is a complete lunatic. I think now uh, we're safe to start mopping up the blood and stuff, and we'll start with this front room here. Like, this guy, I, I think it's the fifth movie, which is basically just the fourth one again, but not as good. There is a scene where he picks up a screaming child holding her under his arm. In the other hand, he's holding a gun and he's using her as bait to lure out Michael. It is so funny. It is impossible for it not to be funny. I once read um, a summary of the movie in which it literally just says, Loomis flashes iron at a child no less than twice in this movie. <laughs> I think it's, is it Halloween 2 or 4, where he's out on the street uh, looking for Michael, and he, by, by now Michael is like this notorious killer that everybody knows about, uh, this is going to be one of those things we can't remove, and he sees a guy in a Michael Myers suit on the street, and he's like, there, stop him, and, and he turns around all confused, and then he gets hit by a police car, slammed into another car, and then bursts into flames. And then later it turns out it's not him, it was some guy in a costume. It's the most overkill, and it's like to a completely innocent bystander. There's another scene where they try to- oh no. Oh no, it's just a bunch of ones and zeros. I was worried it was going to be the combo to like a keypad or something. I don't know, there's a lot of goofy stuff in the movies, and yet it still manages to often land in its scares. And I think a lot of that is, it, it does a very good job of showing the impact that his presence, that the idea of his presence has on people. One of these days I'm going to do a video essay on the Halloween movies, because I really, really do enjoy them. It also helps that, you know, the rampage part of a slasher movie to me is always the least interesting part because it is just like a montage of people getting killed. But these movies don't overstay their welcome because a lot of them are like on the very short end. They're like 70 minutes long usually. They're, they're all like less than an hour and a half. So it's kind of hard to feel like you're wasting your time with them. Let's see, what are some other horror movies that I've talked about? I don't want to talk spoilers about recent horror movies. I want to mainly keep it to like the classic stuff. Uh, I recently... I'll preface this by saying I'm not going to talk spoilers about this one. I recently saw Barbarian. That was a pretty good movie. It's uh, very hard to talk about it without giving spoilers, but it's... Uh, whatever you... Like, if you've seen the trailer or whatever, like, whatever you think this movie's going to be about, that's not what it's about. It starts off as, like, an Airbnb horror story where it's just like, um, oh, I'm in this Airbnb with this other guy who I didn't know was going to be here, but I get whatever, I guess we'll try to make it work. And me telling you that is not a spoiler. There's so much more from there. But man, I got to think of another type of topic to talk about. Reason being, uh, the more I keep talking, the less I have to edit. And I am in a very lazy mood tonight. And anyway, a lot of you did say that they would prefer if I just leave more of this in to be able to watch more of the process. Granted, in the last part, my head was not in the game at all when I was cleaning the orphanage. Maybe that's what led to me betting... Demoted? See, I can't even form a proper sentence right now. I gotta learn... See, I would have far less problems editing if I wouldn't completely restart a sentence when I trip over a word. That's what causes a lot of my issues. Uh, on some maps, you also get extra credit for, like, writing shares and, like, putting things back where they belong. I'm not seeing a designated area for these things, so I'm not assuming that's going to be the case. Any trash in the trash can? No. We'll find out later if some of these side things are trash with a sniffer. These are definitely all going to be garbage. Uh, actually, let's bring you around and see how much small stuff we can fit inside.
So I was talking before about how a lot of the 80s uh, franchises, they went more the direction of comedy than horror, which is pretty disappointing to me. But you know what's a movie that really rode that line perfectly? Stop it, you footsteps. Return of the Living Dead. Because it took a premise that is really scary and actually played it for the maximum horror. The only comedy in the movie comes from the characters themselves and the fact that these, like, naturally funny, naturally eccentric personalities are present in this horrific situation. But they don't act like complete oblivious idiots. They are serious characters who act like they want to live and actually behave pretty intelligently for the most part. But they have their quips, they have their character flaws, they, you know... It's one of those movies where you can just remember every single line after you've seen it a couple of times. I swear that entire movie exists as an mp3 file in my head. I don't know, it's just such good script writing where every little detail stands out so much. Like, I remember uh, in the scene after the guy gets pulled through the window and gets its bra his brains eaten, and then they cut the zombie in half and they're bringing it through the next room, the camera for a long time just lingers on the guy's body on the ground, and you can just hear one of the characters yelling at the other guy, like, what are you doing bringing that thing in there? Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? He's just getting... It's all in the background, off camera, but you can just hear them getting farther and farther away, and this guy getting more and more agitated that he's bringing this thing inside. And the whole movie is just full of things like that. Just things to latch on to. Oh, tell you what. Tell you what, I'm gonna get real controversial. You wanna see a whole bunch of dislikes on this video? This is gonna be why. You know it's a series that has always done that really well is Star Wars, right? That's not the controversial part, just wait. Um, a, a series that does that a lot is Star Wars. Star Wars is a series that is full of unique imagery in every scene. So everything gets remembered throughout the years. And that's a really good thing. That's something you want your movie to have. I knew I was gonna like The Last Jedi. <laughs> a bunch of people are ready to comment now. I knew I was gonna love The Last Jedi when I saw the image um, in the trailer of them riding their speeders across the desert and having all the red salt, I think it's salt, red salt, or some kind of mineral, being dusted up as they go. I knew that was going to be great because I thought that looks like classic Star Wars imagery. Just something that, like, doesn't really need to be in that scene for the plot to work. But it's definitely going to stick with you. Get ready to hit me because this is the part that's controversial. The Last Jedi is my favorite Star Wars movie. Yes, I like it more than A New Hope. Yes, I like it more than Empire. I even like it more than Return of the Jedi, which is my favorite of the original trilogy. Why? Because it is the least Star Wars Star Wars movie. Oh, we can't pick this thing up. There is a gun that you can use in the game. It's more useful for, like, corpses and stuff, because you can just kind of boil them to a gelatinous mass. But it doesn't look like we can use this one. But the reason I love The Last Jedi is because, even though, like, it does have a couple of pacing issues, I think that it's the one that does the best job of conveying consequences. Of showing the way things like this would actually go, and in my opinion, it doesn't lose that sort of whimsical tone that the earlier ones had. It's certainly the darkest by far, even darker than, like, Revenge of the Sith, and that was a movie about... in evil empire taking over and killing everyone. I I knew I was in for a good ride with that because in the beginning of the movie, you know, it starts off with a space battle and it's all cool and stuff. And they lose a lot of people, but in the end they triumph in the evil, like, enemy Star Destroyer is destroyed or whatever. But then it cuts to Leia and she's looking at this display indicating the status of all their fighters. And she realizes that they've lost, like, two-thirds of their fighters. And she just has a look on her face like, Guys, we can't keep doing this. It's the one time they've taken a yeehaw moment in the series and turned it into, like, the reality of, No, like, that cost us something. It's a movie that acknowledges that not everybody gets to be a main character. 
Now, I don't like the trilogy as a whole. I thought The Force Awakens was fun, and I don't... I basically don't remember Rise of Skywalker at all. Like, at all. It, so that is kind of the review. I remember a cavalry charge on a spaceship's, like, hull. That was pretty friggin' awesome. But that's about it. Oh, and somehow Palpatine returned. Good performance for me and McDermott, but, like, you know, why was he there? Y you're allowed to have other villains. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh, yeah, I was talking about The Last Jedi. I like how it just introduced con uh, consequences. Because I feel like what The Last Jedi and, um... I feel like what The Last Jedi and Rogue One are about is about showing the amount of sacrifice involved in these fights. And I understand the people who think, like, oh, come on, it's a fantasy good versus evil movie, let us have our yeehaw. And that's fine, like, it's, you know, the yeehaw is still there. The yeehaw is still very much there. But, you know, I feel like if you're going to continue with this franchise, you know, the old movies are still there. If you're going to continue a beloved franchise, it has to evolve. It has to show you something new. And what better way to evolve than to further explore concepts that were already there in some capacity? You know what I mean? I swear I'm not going to spend this entire video talking about Star Wars. I just want to get out my thoughts on that real quick. A lot of garbage to clean up here. A lot of stone, which... Oh, I see. I guess it's supposed to be the concrete from these pillars that the metal is encased in. All right. Well, it's a lot of it is small enough that we can fit it in here. Got to start talking more about horror movie topics. Back onto the topic of horror. There's still some more stains on the ground over there. I don't think the ash affects us. I don't think we can track that here. But we can... Definitely track the alien blood. Which is certainly going to not do good things for the resale value of this property. Which, remember, is the ultimate reason why we're here. See, look at that. He's just floating on top. I think this one is also just about ready to head over to the portal. I wonder if all these portals lead to the same place. I was talking in the first video about how, like, a bunch of medieval peasants probably started a religion about me. A bunch of mutilated corpses and organs and body parts come flying through this portal into their time, wearing strange clothing. Next, all these haunted artifacts come flying through. Oh, what are these things? They're causing all kinds of havoc. But then it gets a lot more mundane. A lot of, like, you know, coffee mugs, Coke cans, stuff like that. And after a while, everybody's just kind of confused. Let's bring this here. That take-up box is going to fall off, definitely. There we go. I can't move. Come on. Yeah, a whole lot more sweeping up we got to do in this kitchen, which is to be expected. I'm starting to wonder if there even was alien combat in there, or if it wasn't just, like, I don't know, Taco Tuesday. Yep. God, that was satisfying. Now, there's got to be more here. Yeah, see, in some places it sort of blends in with the textures and materials. Uh, we have another bucket over there, so we'll take that with us. And let's start getting all the big heavy stuff. Uh, we can Tetris it to an extent. Like, if we place that vertically, yeah, that'll be the best way of doing it. Oh, right, more about The Last Jedi. Uh, the DJ story is basically about, like, you know, what the likely expected outcome would be of trusting Han Solo. Okay, now I'm done with The Last Jedi stuff for this video. See, the problem with these non-blood stains is that you just never know when your mop is actually full or not. Uh, same with the buckets. But it looks like we're okay still. Uh, what's another good horror movie? Uh, oh, Candyman. Uh, you ever see Candyman? I really like Candyman, I think. I couldn't even get that full sentence out of my mouth before I second-guessed myself. I really don't know how to feel about that movie. 
I'm talking about the original uh, 90s one with Tony Todd. Actually, I think Tony Todd played Candyman in the new one too, didn't he? Or he at least had like a cameo or something? Anyway, the original is really cool because it's basically... It's a movie about urban legends. It's about how, much like Michael Myers, the, the thought of something is so important in culture. How the idea of something can sort of make it real in certain ways. But then again, the way it's handled, like, I feel like the movie sort of goes fever dream on us at a certain point, where it starts to become really confusing and goes way off the rails. I like the idea of having sort of the... Well, I guess it sort of invented the urban gothic aesthetic. Having that, like, really creepy, like, church organ music playing throughout the movie, but it's in uh, Chicago's Cabrini Green. And so the whole thing, even though it's treated almost like a vampire, like Dracula type story, but in these like crumbling brick apartments with graffiti all over the walls, I don't know, it's just really, really interesting. It's about how, it's basically, it's not a movie about Candyman, it's a movie about urban legends generally. Until the end when it's more about Candyland, it just, it just kind of gets a lot more confusing. I don't know, maybe I don't understand it well enough to comment on it. That is also a possibility I've considered. It's a movie that, like, I like a lot more in the first half. Like, I enjoy it a lot more in the first half. And I definitely think it has more to say in the first half, but maybe I'm wrong about that? Of course, the fact that it has, like, four or five sequels means it probably does get stupider after that, but I'm just talking about the first movie. go. Well, you know what? Actually, now that I think about it, maybe I'm looking at this the wrong way. Because, you know, I said that Candyman kind of descends into a fever dream in the later part, which on the one hand, I feel like it doesn't really fit that well with like the themes of the movie itself. But, then again, I do actually enjoy movies that become a weird fever dream after a certain point. Like, uh, Inland Empire, which is a movie that's hard to recommend, but I do take a lot of inspiration from it. Inland Empire is a David Lynch movie. It's definitely the weirdest of the David Lynch movies. But it does at least have a somewhat grounded plot for the first hour, before going completely insane for the next two hours. And another movie, another one of my favorites, is actually Jacob's Ladder, which is a movie that starts off a little bit grounded and then sort of becomes more and more unhinged, more and more confusing as it goes. But I feel like the reason Jacob's Ladder is so great as a fever dream movie is because you have a character that's pretty level-headed and the movie, over time, kind of gaslights you. Like, it'll show you things and you'll start to think it's going in one direction and then there will be like this whole new plot element out of left field but then there will be something later that contradicts that and then whoa what's this about oh we're not mentioning it again whatever like it's all going to a place where you'll sort of start to understand it by the end but even then you don't completely know what exactly it was that happened i don't know i can't really talk a whole lot about jacob's ladder without spoiling it but it's Okay, I'm now realizing, you know, going off of Candyman, that I'll probably have more productive conversations with myself here if I talk more about movies that I'm not really sure how I feel about. And when I think of, like, horror movies that I'm not sure about, uh, the first thing that pops into my head is the original Blair Witch Project. Now, the Blair Witch Project is a movie that I missed out on at the time, and I realized... Oh, no. Sorry, I had to wait for some noise in the background to shut up. Uh, but yeah, a large part of The Blair Witch is something that can only be experienced in the time that it arrived. Because in 1999, you know, nothing like it had really been done before, especially not, like, in such a mainstream way. Like, it had a theater release. There were all kinds of things where they were basically claiming it was a true story. That this group of filmmakers went missing in the woods... They published all these sources on this fake urban legend of the Blair Witch, and then I, I think they even did some thing, like, where the actors couldn't do, like, the talk show circuit. 
they couldn't make, like, public appearances or anything for a certain amount of time after release. Or at least that's what I always heard. Now, at the time, in 1999, I was, like, four years old, and I was more concerned with computer games and Sega than with anything that was going on, like, with current events-wise. So I did, the whole thing kind of went over my head. I wasn't even aware of the movie until years later. So I'm aware that, coming at it, I am from a perspective that doesn't get the full impact of it. But when I watched it for myself in like 2010, 2011, there were elements I enjoyed. I enjoyed the subtlety. I enjoyed how it never really gave in and showed us too much. We never even really learned the exact nature of what's going on there. But that doesn't change the fact that it's two hours of people walking around in the woods for the most part. I mean, the climax is really spooky. And there were some pretty interesting events leading up to that, but the movie's two hours long. Like, did it really need to be that long? But of course, if you're pushing it as a true story, would it really make sense if it conveniently came out to 90 minutes? I mean, I understand that Blair Witch was pretty divisive even when it came out, when it came to opinions on it. Some people praised it for being really, like, raw and realistic and having that really unique premise, while others thought, okay, I'm just watching people argue in the woods for two hours. And honestly, I don't know which camp I fall into. I will say that I feel like the vibe that it hit is perfect for horror movies. I mean, if nothing else, because I don't just look at horror movies from the perspective of whether or not I enjoy them. I also try to look at them from the perspective of do they inspire anything in me? Because even a movie I don't really like can still do something really well and make me think, oh wow, there's still probably a lot you could do with that idea. And Blair Witch is, if nothing else, an extremely inspiring movie. I feel like it has an aesthetic, it has a vibe that is very much... It's very much what I would like to do in horror movies. Sorry, I'm trying to catch this candle. I'm trying to pixel hunt the spot where I can pick it up and get it to fall in. But I think it's weighted to stand upright. Uh, my kingdom for a scroll wheel to go back and forth. Instead it just does that. I'll tell you what's another movie like that, although this is one that I actually really, really do enjoy, even if I can't necessarily call it a good movie. And it's one called The Last Shift. And it's not so much a movie as it is just kind of a series of ideas for things that can happen in a police station. And they are going to be doing all of them, not necessarily in an order that makes sense. And so basically the plot of this movie is that this rookie police officer is on her first day on the job, which is the working the night shift at a police station that is closing down while they move to another one. And because this police station is closing down, those footsteps keep catching me off guard, because this police station is closing down, uh, she's basically the only one there overnight, just kind of working the desk, like, on its last night. And basically, She's only there to redirect calls that say, like, sorry, you called the other station. Now, her personal stake in this is that her dad was a cop at the same precinct uh, who died precisely one year to the day earlier in a shootout with some cultists who they arrested that night. And who actually, I believe the story is that they ended up uh, committing suicide in the cell at that station. Now, the cop that re uh, she relieves, uh, this old guy, basically tells her, like, yeah, weird stuff been going on in this station. Like, you know, nothing mechanically works right, and y y it's just an old crumbling building, and we gotta get rid of it. And so, you know, the way the rest of the night goes is she sits at the front desk, reading her book, answering calls, and over time, weirder and weirder things start to happen. Now, the way the movie progresses is a little odd. It really does feel like they just came up with a series of events that could happen to her, and they just kind of stuck them all on post-it notes on a whiteboard and said, okay, we got to get through all these things by the end of the movie. Because there's no real arc to it. I mean, information about her past and about the station and what happened are all revealed slowly over time, but there's really not that much to reveal, and it's not really the most important thing in the plot. A lot of it really is just, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. And it starts to make her feel a little bit like a Skyrim guard. 
I mean, there's a scene like probably not even a third of the way through the movie where it would normally be the point in a horror film where it's like, okay, things have been weird up until this point, but now we are at DEFCON 1 and we are going into like full panic mode and now the plot begins. And this huge crazy event happens and then she goes back and sits down at the desk. And it's like, okay, <laughs> like, like we're really just going to gloss over that? Like, this is one of the most must-have-been-the-wind characters in the history of cinema, I swear. But it doesn't make the movie itself any less fun. It's still very enjoyable to watch. Sure, the whole thing is just a string of ideas for creepy things that can happen in a police station. But they're good ideas. They're fun ideas. And so, even though it's not exactly a good movie, it's not a bad one either. I mean, if a bad movie... It's sort of like what they say about jokes where if you laugh at a bad joke, is it really a bad joke? I mean, it did what it was setting out to do. And that's kind of how it is with Last Chef. What was another movie? I had another movie kind of queued up in my head um, that it was going to seg off of Last Chef, but I don't think I ended where I thought I would. Oh no, I actually wasn't done talking about Last Chef because I didn't talk about the most important part of it. It's a movie that, like Blair Witch, uh, that was how I was supposed to come off of Blair Witch, actually, um, is a very immersive movie, I think. It's a movie that really, it's very relatable, almost like I say about job simulator horror games, where in the camera work and in the mundanity of a lot of the events, it makes you feel like you're sitting alongside her a lot of the time. Usually what will happen is she'll be sitting at her desk, there'll be like a spooky noise or something, I cannot appear to do anything about these pipes, so I'm going to have to get a plumber to deal with that. Oh, we do have one of these guns, but I don't know if it's really useful to me immediately. Uh, but what was I saying? All right, uh, so a lot of the time she'll hear a spooky noise and go to investigate, and the camera, in instead of just cutting to her arriving at her destination, the camera will follow her in usually one long take down the long hallway through however many winding back rooms and will stay and see things almost from her perspective the entire time. And so there's a lot of tension in just kind of the layout of the police station, how a lot of it is very... It's a lot of tight spaces, a lot of narrow corridors, a lot of side rooms that connect onto other side rooms. And so it's a perfect environment for this type of thing. A lot of the time she'll be walking down the hall and there's like 50 different doors in this hallway. And so the camera will move in such ways where you're constantly thinking like, where is whatever jump scare is going to happen going to come from? And most of the time it doesn't actually hit you with a jump scare. It's a movie that understands that the tension and the setup is better than the payoff. And so it makes it so that most of the movie is setup instead of payoff. And that's a really smart way to tackle it. Uh, something just broke. I hope it was something that's already in the box. It also, uh, towards the end, I mean, you know, minor spoilers, but I have to talk about it. It has uh, one of the nicest looking shootouts I've ever seen. It's hardly a shootout, but like, you know, it's, it's one of the coolest and most realistic looking gunfights I've ever seen, and the most dynamic. There are moments in that movie, I mean, th this is an issue that I have often with a lot of horror movies, where I feel like they just show too much. Which I understand you don't want to pull a Blair Witch and have a movie where they didn't show you anything, but I don't feel like Blair Witch's problem is that it didn't show us anything. I feel like Blair Witch's problem is that it didn't show us anything for like two hours or two and a half hours or however long that movie is. But it didn't need to show us more, and it certainly didn't need to explain more. I'm not going to talk about it too much, because there's not really a whole lot I can say about it without spoiling it, but uh, Hell House LLC is a movie that um, I think kind of rides the line where it shows just a little bit too much. Where I feel like most mainstream horror movies show a lot too much, 
I mean, I talked about this in my video on uh, The Orphanage when I was playing this game. How a movie that could have been good is Dead Silence. But be being a James Wan horror movie, it just wants to take every opportunity for a cheap jump scare. Every opportunity to show you, like, the doll's eyes move when nobody's looking. And it just cheapens the whole experience. I think a good horror movie is one that sets up a lot of scares and only actually pays off a few. And I understand it's probably difficult, like, from a writer's perspective to get the right amount. The way I would say is, you know, film a ton of them. Film more than you think you're going to use, but get it right in the editing room. Because that's what I do. A lot of the time, if I watch a movie that I think is almost good, I'll do my own edit. I really wish I could publish some of these, and I sort of judge how good a movie is in retrospect by how much I actually edited of the movie. So, for example, Dead Silence is a movie where I edited the first half, which is like 45 minutes or so, and of that 45 minutes, I removed like 15 minutes. I realized I was removing all the scares because it wasn't subtle at all. A movie like Hell House LLC, I only removed about two minutes. Just a couple of brief shots that I felt gave away just a little bit too much information. Now, a movie like Blair Witch, I'm actually... I've never attempted to edit that one. But I'm honestly not sure what I would do. Because it's a movie where a lot of it is just tension, being a movie that doesn't have a ton of events. So how much of that can you cut while still maintaining the atmosphere that it creates? Because a lot of it isn't even the fear of the paranormal or what's stalking them in these woods, because they don't even think about that for a lot of it. Most of it is the very real survival fear of just being lost in the woods. Because something that I think about sometimes is what does it mean for something to be a horror movie? Like, what is a horror movie about ultimately? What feeling is it trying to get across? And the conventional wisdom would be, of course, it's trying to scare you, and that's certainly true. But there's different ways of scaring you. There's different types of fear. And a movie has to make the choice of what it wants to focus on the most. You can do multiple types of fear, but you don't want to be, you know, a jack-of-all-trades, ace of none. So a movie like Blair Witch, it's got that paranormal horror, but it's kind of more subtle in the background until the movie's climax. Until then, it's really more of a survival thing. When you say horror story, when you're talking about your own life, yeah, this thing that happened to me, it was a horror story. A lot of the time, it's about you being in a situation that you didn't expect to be that bad, but it just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Basically, at every turn, the worst possible thing happened. Could stand to take a page from, like, the real sort of horror stories that people tell about their own lives. What is going on up here? I mean, I feel like, you know, I, I could say that this is, in a lot of ways, what Barbarian did is, when you're writing, constantly ask yourself, in this moment, like, from this spot that we've gotten to, what is the worst possible thing that could happen? And then do that. Because such a huge part of movies, like The Blair Witch, like The Descent, and all kinds of other things, is the element of despair. Of hope spots, of seeming like, okay, this is going to be the end of it. And then it turns out things were so much worse than you thought, or things get so much worse than you thought. And you're right back in there. It's about that rising hope, and then dashing those hopes throughout. Also, that you can have the thing actually end in darkness, or have that immense catharsis when things finally turn around and the protagonists get their way. And there's very good examples of both types of endings. No, you do not. So yeah, uh, wh wh where, where do I go from here? Every once in a while, I think I'm just going to start alt-tabbing out and just, like, browsing my uh, folder full of horror movies and see what I come up with. Because sometimes all I need to do is skim the names of certain movies and have an idea of some things that I wanted to talk about. Things that I don't really want to put the effort of a video essay into, which, by the way, when's the last time I published one of those? 
But things which I feel are at least worth mentioning. Especially during a time like this, where I'm kind of doing a repetitive task. A lot of horror kind of lives and dies on its premise alone. Where it's like, you know, this movie is going to be about a certain topic, and either you're kind of here for it or you're not. Which, you know, fair enough. Like, you know, sometimes you're just not going to like it just because of, like, the nature of what something is. Or really be into it, whether it's good or not, depending on the nature of what something is. Like, you know, me. Anything to do with, like, urbex or abandonments, I want to see it. I don't care if it's good. Uh, one good example would be The Chernobyl Diaries. A lot of people didn't really like that movie. I like it more than most people. I feel like with a lot of horror movies, it kind of falls apart in the end, but I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, for now, I'll talk more about the movie itself. But that's another movie which, like Last Shift, um, it basically has a very immersive philosophy when it comes to its camera work, where a lot of the time you feel like you're there in that environment with the actors. It's very dynamic, it's very flowing, and it really emphasizes you seeing what the characters are seeing. You don't get a whole lot more information than they do. If they only saw something briefly, you only saw something briefly. We don't get POV shots of, like, creatures looking at them from windows or, like, peering around a corner. We only know what they know. There's even a whole scene where, like, a character who would have been, like, probably the protagonist in a different movie goes out to investigate while they're huddled in a car in the dark. And all we get is, like, just muzzle flashes and gunshots in the distance. And then one of the two party coming back all injured. It's just such a great way of doing things. And what I really love about that movie is, you know, this is me being interested in the premise. It spends, like, the first third of its runtime just them walking around exploring, which I love so much. I appreciated so much of that. So even though the plot isn't that strong, even though the movie is just kind of like, it just kind of descends into running away from, like, monsters and stuff, I still really enjoyed it on the whole. Like I said, it lives and dies on the premise. Now, I did say a minute ago that um, a lot of horror movies, in my opinion, tend to fall apart once they reach sort of that ending stage in the climax, or sometimes even long before that. And I think, like, the typical Hollywood structure is the reason for that. I feel like horror movies do kind of have a little bit more leeway than others in the genre to have, like, non-standard endings. But still, the best part of horror is always the build-up. It's always in that rising tension where you don't even necessarily really know what exactly is going on yet. And I feel like a lot of horror movies, they throw that away way too early for a climax, or worse yet, have the protagonists spring into action. As soon as the protagonists go on the offensive, it stops being a horror movie in my eyes. It can make for some nice catharsis, sure, and some movies get into it way, way, way too early. Some movies, like, half the runtime is, like, characters trying to, like, figure out what's going on or, like, how to defeat the monster or whatever. And it's like, who's hunting who here? And I think that's the reason why I find so many horror movies get so much less satisfying in their second half is because they have their rising action where you're not sure what's going on, where you're constantly speculating and trying to figure out what's happening and what the threat is going to be. And then at a certain point, they have to explain it. They have to explain what they're dealing with, and they have to explain what they're going to do about it. Or worse yet, they just kind of have the threat brought to the light, and it just becomes a montage of characters getting killed. And I find either possibility much less interesting than just that fear of the unknown. Because the best part of horror is the mystery. It's the fear of the unknown. It's not knowing what we're dealing with or how it's going to be dealt with. Where in action movies or sci-fi or all kinds of other things, it's about what do we do now that we have this information. Horror movies are more about what is the information. Yeah, now that I'm thinking about it, that is it, isn't it? It really does all come down to the fact that a horror movie, at least a dedicated horror movie, can't follow the typical movie structure of a rising action, a midpoint, and then a resolution. 
because the resolution means that the tension that you built up the entire time is over. And when you start getting into that earlier on, basically the earlier you get into that, the less of the movie actually is doing the thing that it's set out to do. I mean, look, maybe it's just my taste in plot structure. Maybe this isn't necessarily a hard rule, but I think a lot of people would agree with me. Because I, I say this stuff a lot about games like Fears to Fathom or Chillizard games, where I feel like the best horror stories are ones that aren't phrased as a narrative in a movie, but ones that are rather phrased as, here's a thing that happened. Really telling you a story, as if it's something being told around a campfire, as this is something that happened to me. And a lot of the time that means unanswered questions. I have no idea what that was about. It can mean capturing a feeling. Something that simple, because so many horror stories are as simple as just a feeling. And hearing how afraid someone is as they recount that feeling. I mean, so many scary work stories are just, yeah, I was working the counter at 7-Eleven at 3 a.m. And this dude came in and just bad vibes, man. And that's obviously really, really hard to translate into a movie if he's not going to pull out a knife and try to stab you at some point. But if you can do it, you're going to achieve some great results. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is exactly what I was talking about before when I said that a horror story should just be a continuing series of... And then a crazy thing happened and it got way friggin' worse. Because there's no real build up. There's no thing that they did to deserve it. They don't like, you know, piss off an old mystic woman or anything like that. It's literally just they're out in the middle of nowhere where anything can happen. And unfortunately for them, anything does. Everything is so abrupt. Everything is so raw. Everything is so just unpleasant. It's a movie that feels like or rather, it's a movie that smells like it's just been baking in the hot sun. It just puts you into a very particular vibe that is almost hypnotic. And of course, then you get to the infamous dinner table scene. And it's one of those... It's probably one of the scariest scenes I think ever put to film. Not because it causes a jump scare. Not even because it's the kind of thing that'll have you looking over your shoulder for the next few days. It's just the kind of thing where, like, it feels like it goes on forever. It is truly something horrific, where when you're watching it, you can imagine yourself in that situation, and all you want is to leave the room. And when she finally does get a chance to break free and run out, you feel like you take a breath of fresh air. But it's not over by a long shot. There's this long, exhausting chase that goes all over the place. I think it might even go out and back into the house and back out of the house again at some point. It's just this panicked chase where she doesn't even know where she's going. She's just, any direction there's not somebody chasing me, that's where I'm running. I Every moment is about keeping herself alive for one second longer. It's actually a lot like what the Outlast chase feel like, which is really cool to see put to film. Because it doesn't have like a progression like, it, it doesn't have that Ichabod's bridge, if you know what I mean. It doesn't have that I just need to get over here and I'm safe. It is pure panic because she knows she has to run but she doesn't know where she's going to go and that is absolutely terrifying it really reaches into that sense of despair that i talked about before that sense of i'm keeping myself alive moment to moment but i know i can't keep this up forever and then of course in the end she gets lucky she doesn't defeat the evil villains she doesn't learn what they were about or how they came to be she just gets away with her life, and she does not care to pursue it any further. Because who would? That's what I love about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And then there's all these, like, remakes and sequels and stuff. I think the second one is just, like, a straight-up comedy. Which, like, fair enough, because at least you're doing something different with it. But then all the other ones, like, feel the need to explain more, where it's like, but don't you want to know where he got his chainsaw? I don't know, I assume they drove into town and bought it from the store or something. Who cares? This is starting to happen with some frequency. In fact, I think what I'm going to have to do is call another one of you. 
leave you right about here, and you'll just be the dedicated gore bucket for a while. I think now would be a good time to start, like, mopping up generally. Oof. Start mopping up over here a little more, because I'm pretty bored with that hallway. I swear I keep hearing new sounds in amongst the old stuff. Yeah, a little bit right there. I'm a little bit surprised and concerned that we can't pick up these samples. Because that suggests to me that uh, my employer wants something to do with them. Is this how we get Resident Evil? Anyway, let's begin uh, removing all these. Oh, there's something I can talk about. The Resident Evil movies. I have not seen it. I don't even know like what number they are, how many there are. I haven't seen all of them, and I don't care to see any more than I did. The last one I saw was the one that came out in 2012. Of all of them, the only Resident Evil movies that I like are the first and second one. I find them at least entertaining for as stupid as they are. The rest, I don't know, they're all just kind of like boring garbage and set pieces and they're just... They don't have that life in them. They don't feel entertaining. They don't even feel like cheesy in a fun way. They're just kind of soulless. They're just kind of empty. And for that reason, I don't think they're very good. Now, I will say, the one that I saw in 2012, um, it had the sickest ending of anything ever, because it ended with they're at the White House, and there's a whole bunch of soldiers, and they're all defending it, there's a big wall around it, and there's just a sea of zombies and mutants surrounding it, and it's like, we are in for the fight of our life, the siege of DC has begun. From what I understand, like, as soon as the next movie came out, which was like five or six years later or something like that, I just checked. Do they continue with that? No, they skip right over it? Okay, understandable. Good day, sir. I will not be watching anymore. But I tell you what, forget about the movies. What about the Resident Evil games? I actually slept on the games for the longest time until Resident Evil 7 actually kind of reinvigorated my interest. And the reason for that is because I was a little kid, I was like, oh man, I love zombies. And so I begged my parents to rent for me a Code Veronica X from, uh, from Blockbuster. Dating myself, aren't I? So we went, we got Code Veronica X, and, uh, you know, we brought the game home, played it, and I was so afraid. Like, first of all, I couldn't figure out what to do. I think it starts off with you're in a jail cell, and you have to figure out to light the lighter in your inventory, and then you get jump-scared by a guy who's just beyond the bars, because it's like pitch black. So I was already in a very creeped out mood. I was such a scaredy cat as a kid, where like, I, I would refuse to look at the screen if a horror movie was on. I only liked like children's horror. Um, and then you had to make your way around in the dark and it was super spooky. And then upstairs you got to the graveyard and zombies started coming out of the ground and I was like, nope, 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 the end. And that was the last I really heard about Resident Evil for a long time. For some reason I was fine with the movies, but they weren't really very horror-oriented. Um, but anyway... Okay, so that's where we're at with trying to transport these pieces of the door. But anyway, years later, Resident Evil 7 comes out, the trailers and the demo all look really interesting. It's more of a first-person survival horror vibe, which by that time I'm more into that stuff. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. I actually disliked Resident Evil 7, uh, or I didn't dislike the game. The part I disliked the most, I mean, was when it started, well, being a Resident Evil game. But then, you know, a couple years go by, and I played the Resident Evil 2 remake, and I think that was when I started to see the appeal of the series. Now, I had tried, like, a couple of times over the years to get into them. I mean, like, I, I just couldn't stand the gameplay. I hated the tank controls, hated the fixed cameras. And I understand that the fixed cameras were so that they could do some, like, really impressive stuff with, like, PS1-era technology. And it really was in incredible. Like, that was how you get, like, a PS1 and PS2 game to look like a 360 game. It was nuts what they were able to do with it. But I just didn't like to play them. 
Playing the Resident Evil 2 remake, I think, is what really allowed me to kind of see it from the perspective of how people who enjoyed it would have seen it at the time. Because I feel like in that way, it is a remake in the truest sense. It's like they took that idea and just did it now. Because it still had all those, like, you know, survival horror, the inventory management, the, you know, creeping around elements and trying to solve puzzles and figure out where you had to go. It had the... It had the environment that you spent a lot of time in, and so you got to know the space. It wasn't constantly progressing from one area to the next. It put you in this highly detailed environment and said, this is the area that you need to unravel. And I loved that about it. I enjoyed the heck out of Resident Evil 2 Remake because it felt like what the old games were going for, except it updated the mechanics to make them less frustrating, to make them better for a modern audience. And I think it's that perfect integration. Not to mention the graphics were incredible. And it ran pretty well, too. A whole lot of extra garbage in this hallway. I got my work cut out for me. I do wish I had played Resident Evil 2 Remake on the channel. I own the 3 Remake. I have heard that it's not nearly as long and just generally isn't as good. Um, like, it's a lot faster paced, a lot more action-y. Which I can sort of understand. I mean, I did enjoy the action in Resident Evil 2, even though there wasn't a lot of it. But I just, what I really loved was being able to see, even in a complete from the ground up remake, what it was inspired by. Because it had that resource management. Because it had those moments where it's like, okay, there's a liquor in that hallway. I could kill it, but do I want to expend the ammo? And I just loved having to make those decisions. How everything you wanted to do had a cost, and you could weigh that cost and decide how you wanted to approach a given situation. It was very, very fun in that way. And I'm told that Resident Evil 3 Remake is just kind of more shoot the thing. And it's very much like we're not going to spend a lot of time in a given area. I'll tell you what, for these bigger things... Maybe we'll put them in these garbage cans, which I might have to get rid of anyway. And just sort of stick them vertically. There we go. And, uh, yeah, we can kill a few birds with one stone this way. One of my biggest regrets on this channel was... I mean, I didn't review it poorly, but I feel like I just came off as, like, really disinterested in the ending of uh, Resident Evil Village. Now, Resident Evil Village was a really good game. My one real criticism with it was that, like, the castle was the most interesting location, and it's, like, the one place you can't go back to after it's over. Or at least I don't think you can. But I feel like I came down too hard on it for two reasons. The first was because I finished it in, like, a four-hour, like, marathon session because I just wanted to get it done already. Uh, because prior to Outer Wilds, I had been really, really slow to get series done. And also, like, a big part of it, I think, was the fact that... Uh, I don't want to spoil it here. I don't want to spoil it here, but they killed off a major character from previous games. And to me, like, when you kill off a character in a sequel, it makes me... And call this irrational, but it makes me like the previous thing they were in less. It makes me feel like... Even though that's always kind of an expected outcome in horror media, it makes me feel like, okay, so everything we just did, like, well, everything we did for survival was for nothing. And even though Village kind of sets it up where, where it's like, okay, well, no, because you're living on through this sort of legacy, I, I, that didn't land for me, especially after being so burned out on everything. Um, but Resident Evil Village was a really good game up until that point. I liked how it expanded the combat, which... See, I was sort of hot on cold on that point. Because it was much more action-focused. It still had some great horror. In fact, I think at the peak of Resident Evil Village's horror, it was scarier than anything in Resident Evil 7. Um, but there were also, like, there were a lot of times, especially towards the end, where, like, you were walking around in this factory and it just went on forever, where you were walking back and forth through the same repetitive, ugly building. Um, and it, it just contributed to a lot of burnout.
But as I was saying, you know, I wasn't sure how to feel about how much more actionized it was. Because even though they did take a note from Resident Evil 7 and they improved on the action, I like Resident Evil 7 the best just because, as I was saying before, it's that, you know, you're either here for the premise or you're not. I much preferred the premise and the setting of that dilapidated old house in the bayou, of the Texas Chainsaw family of lunatics trying to kill you. And so even though Resident Evil Village represented a big increase in scale, I don't know if a big increase in scale is necessarily what I wanted. And it becomes hard to review a game on those grounds, because do you review it on what I consider to be wasted potential that others might not consider it to be? Or do you review it on, hey, they went in a different direction, but they did good things with that direction. They adapted their core gameplay and visuals and all of that to make the most of it, instead of just trying to do all of that with the original ideas. So it's hard to say. I don't think I like Resident Evil Village as much as 7, but it is fair to say that it's a very good game that improved on a lot of things. You can't call it poorly made. Scrubbing that ceiling. Always gotta remember to look up. But the thing is, these stains on the ceiling look so much just like rust, you know? Rust-colored blood on a rust-colored ceiling. I mean, maybe it's meant to trick the player, but I don't feel like this is the game that should be trying to trick the player. I'm trying to decide whether I should just cut the moments where I'm not talking or leave them in. Honestly, do not know. Because on the one hand, this video will be like four hours long, but also, you know, some people like four hours long. But do they like four hours of me talking, or is anybody actually watching me put these things away? Because a lot of people just kind of like listen to me while they're going to sleep, or like while they're in the car. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of librarian watchers who don't even really like watch the video. Especially for a game like this, where, you know, there's no like suspense of like, ooh, what's going to happen next, or where's the scare going to come from? It is literally just commentary. I mean, this is basically a podcast with me playing a game in the background. That was how it was for uh, the Walking Dead Survival Instinct video. I mean, I played that entire game, and I hardly even talked about the game. That was literally just a vessel to talk about the show. There have been a couple of times where I, like, paused to go do something or whatever, but, you know, it doesn't matter. I would like another furnace because I'm getting real irritated with these things that have to be carried over there and make a trip each time. Granted, I understand some of these maps are meant to be big enough that you can kind of easily co-op them. But I'm not in co-op right now. Oh, I feel so taunted by all these laughs echoing down the halls. I think now would be a good time, since this hallway is all that's left. I think we'll save ourselves a lot of trouble if we start mopping now. I believe I brought over some buckets, so that's good. Although from the sound of it, there's still some grossness on the floor beneath me. Those are black footsteps. So maybe the ash really can uh, gross me up. Yeah, okay, so I just walked on some ash just now, and it didn't seem to do anything. Maybe it's just because it was mixed with my mop at some point? Get rid of that. And you. See, one issue with uh, a rundown map like this is that you don't start to see it become clean. I mean, you see the debris become less and less, but that's it. With other maps, especially ones with, like, a lot of gore, part of it is the increased mobility. That's some of the satisfaction that you get, is being able to just walk around without causing even more of a mess. It smells. Oh, <laughs> I was going to try to replace the bottom with, uh, good. And by replace, I mean I was going to remove the bottom and just say that.
There's still all kinds of nastiness on the floor, I think. I mean, besides the obvious, I mean, they are the floors of a prison cell. Which, by the way, that's another misconception that, like, so many movies and, like, books and all kinds of things have. Is the idea that an asylum is like a prison. Now, institutions like this, as far as I know, don't really exist anymore, at least in America. But, basically, every... I, I mean, I've explored a few of them, and they never really look like that. Even the one I explored that was explicitly for uh, criminally insane uh, patients... It didn't really feel like a prison. Remember, a psych hospital is supposed to be a hospital first. And most patients would be there voluntarily. Now, of course, in the criminal building, which you can look that up on my channel, I explored it like eight years ago at this point. Uh, I believe I called it the Madhouse. So I suppose I'm not exactly doing my part to dispel those uh, images. But basically, it was a place for uh, criminal inmates, um, or rather, people who were sent there as an alternative to prison uh, in a criminal trial. And so, like, one of the patients there was, uh, apparently it was a famous story. He's still alive and still locked up. Uh, and it was a guy who, well, apparently, he was a cannibal teacher who apparently uh, killed, uh, sexually assaulted, and ate one of his students. But not at the school. I don't know why I made that distinction, but there it is. You have it now. Um, and I believe at one point he might have actually even run the hospital's uh, internal newspaper. And I believe uh, the most dangerous uh, patients were kept... I have to keep correcting myself from saying inmates. Uh, the facility's most dangerous patients were kept on the top floor. And to mark them as dangerous, uh, they would have their heads shaved. They would all be moved in a line, in a group, whenever they had to bring them to another building. But as for the entire rest of the facility, this was just one building. The entire rest of the campus was, well, it was mostly voluntarily. Most people could leave whenever they wanted. Wasn't that even a plot point in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest? Where uh, Jack Nicholson's character is like, you know, he's planning like, okay, I have an idea, like, we're gonna all bust out of here. And all of them just kind of look at him and they're like, you're the only one that's here by court order. Like, most of us can leave whenever we want. Like, we're here trying to get better. We don't have to bust out. Toothbrush in the sink. Disgusting. You know, a lot of larger objects here. You gotta angle them correctly, but it's so hard to Tetris when you can't control your depth. All these tools. This whole conversation is actually reminding me. I kind of wish that horror movies wouldn't go so over the top with their backstories. Because you can give a place a horrific history without having it be like, oh yeah, they like tortured the patients for no reason and did all kinds of like experiments on them. And like, it's not like stuff like that doesn't happen, but I feel like you can have much more mundane like sources of that horror. For example, uh, the place that I often explore, it was different things throughout the years. I mean, there were times when it was considered a fairly good place to go with a very high success rate, and then there were times when it was pretty bad, but only due to doctors having sort of incorrect ideas about how to treat patients. I mean, there was a time when it was basically lobotomy central. That's not malice, that's just like, you know, having an incorrect idea about how to go about treatment. But of course the result is no less horrifying. I feel like that can be almost worse than like an evil mad doctor torturing you. A group of people who want to help you doing all kinds of horrible things to you while ignoring your pleas to stop. I'm losing everything. Yaboo. When everything goes in on the first try, what that tells me is that I was actually standing way too close and ha had a very real possibility of being swallowed up by the portal myself. More footprints here. 
Uh, I've got a couple of big boxes that I have not yet brought over to the portal. I'm about to deliver Halloween to the Middle Ages. Let's just stick this on top. One thing that I don't really understand while exploring is who's doing certain things. Like, I understand often you'll find holes in the walls, toilets ripped out, stuff like that, because wiring, pipes, all of that can be valuable, and it gets taken by scrappers. Who is pulling the lids off of the toilet seats? Because it will, without a doubt, be every single one you encounter. Unless a place is, like, really well taken care of. And why am I still running into these things? I'm really hoping it was just unnoticed within this debris. Uh, I should probably grab another bucket, because I am kind of cleaning that last hallway now. We actually have made a decent amount of progress, but why am I going all around through there? I should be going this way. Yeah, I've been doing this all wrong. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take this one on its own and then just start doing the rest, because the rest is all small pieces. I felt like this is taking forever, but it's actually going much faster than I thought, all things considered. Although I am going to have to go around with the sniffer, wouldn't want to be demoted again for cleaning 95% of debris in an abandoned, crumbling, haunted orphanage. I suppose I did technically leave it worse than I found it, but that wasn't my fault, because there was that floor that collapsed. Ah, these big pieces. And there's no sprint button, you can only hold shift to slow, which, to be fair, is much more useful than sprinting in a lot of the contexts you'd want to use it. I would rather have that than sprint, but I'd like to have both. Make it so that alt slows me down, and sprint is shift like every other game ever made. Urbex, by the way, like, I get a lot of questions about, like, how to get started with Urbex, what to look for, how to do things. I am working on a tutorial right now. Uh, I was going to do it, like, two years ago, and now I've kind of restarted it because it's become more of a topic of discussion on the Discord recently. Um... But that is coming. I'm going to explain all the basics. You know, I don't. it's not like I do anything super crazy myself. I'm not, like, rappelling down from buildings or exploring mine shafts. But I can at least help you to get started. And I think a lot of the video is just going to be about um, kind of setting expectations right. Because so many people, when they're first starting out, myself included, kind of treat it as, like, a spec ops mission. But in reality, it's usually much more mundane. It's much more cool than creepy, at least in my experience. Like, one of the things people always say is, like, I would love to explore, but, like, I could never do it because I'd be too scared. In my experience, as long as you're not alone, it's not really scary at all um, in person. I mean, I try to make it look a little bit spooky in the videos with, like, editing and such and presenting it a certain way. But to me, it's, especially if you go during the day, it's really more eye candy than anything. And especially, like, going during the day is so underrated. So many people talk about, like, if you're going to do it, you got to go at night. And sure, you can do that, and it's spooky, but, like, you enjoy the scenery more, you enjoy the location more when you go during the daylight. And there's also less risk of vampires. Now, I think these wood pieces are going to have to be on their own, which is real annoying, but... At least we're coming closer to the end of this thing. But yeah, like, so an example of people having, like, the wrong expectations when it comes to Urbex. When I first started, um, like, the first time I got into it, uh, now not counting exploring, like, my family's old house on an island uh, when I was, like, seven years old, I was, like, 15 or whatever, and my friend told me, like, yeah, a couple blocks down from me, there's this abandoned house on the corner. And I said, okay, cool. And I went over there and we kind of looked around. Uh, we didn't have a light or anything. And this was the days like a little before smartphones or a little before everybody had smartphones. So we had no light for going in the back room. So we could only see the light from what was coming in the front door. So we kept it very short. And I was just so hooked. Just the idea of standing around thinking about like the memories some family might have made there. 
so cool. And of course, I've escalated a lot since then. And we made several return trips back there. And on one of those return trips, I went with two friends. And we were like, okay, well, we're abandoned. It's an abandoned spot. We've got to be prepared. There could be all kinds of like homeless or drug addicts, which in our mind was like enemies in a video game. And so, you know, one of my friends brought like this like big hunting knife. We picked up a branch from the ground and like sharpened it into a spear. We were like walking down the road looking like we were going to go fight vampires or something, but definitely not Blade. And it's so... Looking back, I cringe at that so much because if we had gotten caught inside that abandoned house, the police would have said, what are you doing here? Get out of here. And maybe called our parents if we're, like, you know, not polite and respectful or whatever. Also helps that we are white as ghosts. What would have happened would have been a lot more serious if we had been caught walking into an abandoned house with all kinds of, like, weapons, like we're getting ready to go, like, fight the Viet Cong or something. Weapons are always, like, people talk about, like, oh, you should bring a gun. Absolutely not. They, say, they always say, like, you know, if you're going to commit a crime, only commit one crime at a time. And that holds especially true for urbex. In most countries, there are hardly any consequences for getting caught on a first offense at a location. In the U.S., you're also very likely to get very light um, consequences, if any at all. Most likely a ticket or something. But it can really escalate in a huge way if you have any kinds of weapons, drugs, tools, anything like that. That's, well, that's also why I never break in. They're always like, well, do you have, like, tools to, like, you know, tear down boards or, like, smash open a window? I never do any of that. There's almost always a way in. And if there isn't, come back later, because there will be something. Not only is it a lot more risk to you personally to do that stuff, or even to be caught with tools on you, even if they don't see you, like, breaking in. But it's also, like, you know, you're opening the place up, you're making it very, very easy, because if you're going to break in, you're probably going to choose the most obvious entrance. It means other people get in, and those people trash the place, and now the location is ruined. Like, a lot of people don't really seem to care about, like, graffiti and stuff. I don't mind it to an extent, but I prefer to find places as intact as possible, because all the interesting stuff gets lost or stolen or destroyed. For example, like, if you look at most of the Psych Hospital videos on my channel, like, I, I don't say where it is out of just, like, habit. But you could probably, like, I don't take too much care. You could probably figure out where it is for yourself if you wanted. Because there's a lot of, like, very, very iconic imagery of it. And you'll notice that place is so well known that it's completely trash. Like, it's head-to-toe graffiti. So much worse than it was when I started going there, like, seven years ago. And viewers don't mind that, but I don't really care for it. Now, there is another video of a place I've been to on my channel, which which I am a lot more careful with that location. Uh, I called it the Hangman's Wellness Center. There's two videos of it, which you can scroll back in the Urbex playlist and see. Or I guess there's technically three, but we didn't get in during one of them. And that place is the polar opposite. Hardly any graffiti, hardly any destruction that isn't natural. But there was so much left behind. Documents with, like, leading to specific people and times and places. Specific actions and events. All kinds of equipment. Exercise machines, you know, treadmills, ellipticals, even a few tanning beds in the back. A pool, which I believe has now been, uh, has now been sealed off. Ah, oh, one of my favorite finds ever. Probably my favorite find ever. That place was a gold mine. I will never use its real name in any capacity on this channel. And yeah, it does, like, move around on top to a certain extent, even as I'm just turning my view. So if I'm walking, I have to weigh up, like, would it be faster just to make two trips? And the answer is, at this point, no, but overall, probably yes. What I was talking about earlier with, like, you know, a lot of people, like, kind of think of the homeless as enemies in a video game. And look, they can be a threat potentially. Like, I'm not naive about that. I'm not going to be like, oh, every, like, homeless person is just, like, a poor person down on their luck. I understand there is a lot of substance abuse. There is a lot of mental illness. And even if it's not necessarily their fault, it can make them a threat. But most of the time, that's not going to be the case. 
Most of the time they want to be left alone. Most of the time they just want you to leave. And if they want you to leave, you leave. I personally have only encountered one homeless person ever and he was helpful. He told me about like, you know, the place we were heading into because I guess we were going into it and he was living there. And he was just kind of, he just kind of gave us a heads up about like some of the dangers and stuff. And it was like, all right, cool. Now that place that we were going to, um, or no, you know what it was? The guy wasn't living there at that moment. He was living in the area, but he used to live at the place we were going to. It was a golf course that was abandoned and like a whole club attached to it. And we were on our way to go explore it and he gave us some tips. But when we finally got there, um, there was a cop like sitting in the parking lot and at that point, I had to go up and talk to the cop, because the way I see it is, like, if you're walking up and, like, you know, going somewhere you're not supposed to be, it's way more suspicious if you round a corner, see a cop, and do a 180 and walk away. Then they're going to want to talk to you, and they're really going to grill you. So I kept walking forward, and I walked up to him and talked to him, made sure my camera was very visible, and I was like, hey, we're going to go in here and explore this. Is that okay with you? And he said, well, I'm just here to watch the highway. I don't really care what you do. But, like, the owner of this place, uh, he's getting ready to demo it, and he was having problems. Uh, with, there were a lot of homeless people living inside, uh, so there's cameras up there, and, you know, he's, like, in Florida or whatever, but if he sees you on the cameras and he calls us, I'm going to have to arrest you. So we are like, all right, and, you know, I, once we saw the cop, we weren't going to go in anyway, um, but we had to just, like, make ourselves less suspicious. The way I see it, at every location, you get to play dumb exactly once. And here in particular, you can really hear that ghostly wailing. I wonder if maybe the ritual... Like, if we're going to piece together a story here, if we're going to talk about the actual game for a second, I wonder if the story here isn't that they were doing experiments, all kinds of horrible things, to these patients... Ah, the physics in this game. Good God. But they were doing all that stuff. Maybe the ritual that we found in somebody's cell is what caused them to be able to come back as ghosts and maybe gain some kind of power that they wouldn't have otherwise had. Oh, there's so much more that still has to go. But we are nearing the end of it. The only issue is that because we started close to the portal, which is what you want to do to prevent yourself from having to walk over a sea of blood and debris, we do have to make a much larger trip every single time. Something else that I wish, uh, which is sort of circling back to horror tropes, but also still talking about the urbex angle, I wish they would start portraying asylums more realistically. That's sort of the purpose of the map that I'm working on right now. It's actually pretty close to release. I just have a couple of bugs to fix and then it's done. Um, but they don't feel like a real building that has an intended purpose. A lot of the time, even in movies, they're laid out like something from a video game. Like, if you look at Outlast, it sort of tries to be a little bit better about it, but the progression doesn't make any sense. Like, imagine you're a worker in Mount Massive, once you get to the front door, you got like a 45 minute commute to wherever you're working. Like how many windowless rooms can there be in an asylum? You're breaking so many fire codes, there's no ventilation. I feel like Mount Massive when you view it from the outside kind of makes sense, but the interior kind of doesn't. Even though in Whistleblower it does make it all connect in a way that's sort of cohesive, it's still not a thing that would ever exist. You know what's a movie that actually did it well because they actually shot in a real abandoned building? Is, uh, Session 9. That's a movie that I feel like I was too young for that one when I watched it. Um, it's definitely a very slow burn. And I was kind of bored by it when I watched it. Like, I was very intrigued by it about what was going to happen next. I was probably like 15 when I watched it. But it didn't go in the direction I was expecting, and so I feel like I kind of mentally checked out at the time. I'll have to give that one another watch, because I feel like that's one that would benefit from me understanding it better. You know what else is a movie that I enjoyed more as an adult, though? Day of the Dead by George Romero. Now, 
I've always been like a huge zombie fan ever since I was a kid. I love The Walking Dead. I love the Romero movies. There was a period where I pretty much loved any zombie content I could get my hands on. One that I didn't really care for was Day of the Dead. Because to my child brain, I thought this is really slow, this is really boring, there's hardly any like action in it, it's just a bunch of people talking. I like it so much more now, maybe even more than Dawn. It's a movie that's really more about the questions of what happens after. You know how some horror movies, like, you know, they sort of delay their catharsis? This movie has one of the best catharses ever, and it actually comes from the zombies. From that end point where, because throughout the whole movie, there's this doctor who's kind of been trying to teach a zombie, trying to regain some cognitive function, and he's had some level of limited success. But the military guy who's in charge of this whole place, he doesn't care because, like, well, like, if you're not going to kill them or cure them, like, what are you even doing here? Sort of what the movies are building towards is that the zombies sort of become, like, a next evolution of mankind. But that's not explored until, like, 20 years later in Land of the Dead. But what I was getting at is here... We get that moment where, like, one of the last of the evildoers is, like, running away, running down the halls from the zombies, closes the door behind him, and he's now in the lab area, where the only zombie is this one that's been learning. And he sees it shuffle out into the hall, it's in the distance, and he's just like, alright, I'm finally gonna get to kill this stupid thing. And it's, it's one of the most perfect moments of directing, because it, it moves to the beat of a song that hits at just the right pace where he's walking down the hallway getting ready to kill this zombie that has been sympathetic for the entire movie while this guy has been so unsympathetic and the zombie turns and we see just the smirk wipe off this guy's face as it raises a gun and that's one of the most aw yeah moments in zombie cinema and it happens, like, we're rooting for the zombie in that scene. It is so good. But we only have to clean the debris out of this room, really. For these couple of rooms. We're so, so close. Of course, there's probably debris all over the place that I don't even know about that's been flying out of these boxes this entire time. Yeah. Every time I walk through these doorways... That's always when I seem to step in something. Which I do know that sometimes there can be shenanigans with, like, irregular surfaces. But I think this thing's just about had it, and it's time to, uh... Is there something on the ground there? No? It's time to bring this back. We are almost finished with this place. Of course, we will have to do a run with the sniffer. Especially to find any things we might have dropped. Come on, slide through. There's only just that little narrow bit of space, otherwise it won't work. And you can't move it at all if you're completely full. Just made it. Yep. I really, really do wish that I had, like, the legal freedom to post some of the edits that I've made to horror movies. Because some of them are actually, like, quite significantly changed. Like I said, Dead Silence, I removed, like, 15 minutes. Or, I say like I said, I try to keep all these videos self-contained, but I also try to avoid going over old ground too much, and that can become quite a balancing act after a while. Basically, in Dead Silence, I found that I was cutting all the scares. Because amid this dumb movie about a dummy that moves its eyes and, like, runs around and, like, kills people or whatever was a pretty subtle horror flick that I actually really liked, that had a lot of creepy elements. I'm just... Oh, these doors do open. It just wasn't working when I tried it before. No, you have to hit exactly the right spot. You... It doesn't work between the bars. You have to be touching the bars, but our crosshair is invisible. Okay, so a little bit of extra work, but not a ton. I think whenever it, you have to optimize your trip, it's not that you have to optimize your trips as well. So like, if there's something big and you need to go back for another tool, it helps to pick up that big thing, bring it back to the thing, and then pick up the tool on the way back. 
That way you save yourself a trip. Uh, let's start taking all the small things, and we'll save the big things for their own trip. I should have inserted that clipboard first so that it could be flat. Maybe it still can be. We do it vertically. Oops. Viscera cleanup detail really needs viscera to be fun. Because in a regular map, cleaning isn't just about being like, okay, I finished that room, I finished that room, I finished that room. It's about paving the way. It's about taking a bloody mess and making it look just like a normal place again. Although maybe with a little bit of damage. Here, it really just looks like we're trying to use a leaf blower to blow the leaves out of the forest, which is a real task my dad actually assigned me to do one time. Come on, get out of there. And sometimes things get stuck. Now you can use the... I don't know if we ever picked up the broom, but we do have a shovel. Come on, get out of there. Ah. Uh. I think it's clipped inside. But I'll tell you what we can do. All right, hang on, I'll come back to that. We'll finish uh, cleaning this up because I've been recording for about two hours, 40 minutes at this point. Uh, I did take a couple of breaks, but uh, so the video won't be that long, but yeah, I've been at this for a while is the point. And we want to finish cleaning all this up so that we can employ my totally ethical and totally up-to-code solution for how we get rid of that piece of paper stuck in the toilet. We don't try, you know, flushing, since uh, judging by the irregular dripping coming from the pipes, the plumbing is clearly still working. Can we get a heavy piece to slide down on top? I think that's about all we're going to get. Oh, it wants to bubble up. Oh, oh, that precariously balanced cup. It doesn't even look like it's on the thing. There it goes. Ugh. Movies that are creepy, but literally just comfy. I don't know if that's actually something that even exists in terms of movies, but actually, you know what? I've uploaded this to my channel years ago. I'll put the link in the description, but you can actually watch it yourself on my channel because I knew there wouldn't be any copyright issues. There was a book that I took out, or a movie rather, that I took out as a kid from the library, and it was called The Spooky Book. It was an animated reading of what I presume is an actual book, and it's just like, it's a story about these two kids who both come into possession of the same spooky book on just a rainy, dark night while they're home alone. And it is the, I can't believe I've never talked about it before, it is the epitome of creepy and comfy. It was even more so in a meta sense for me because I found it at my local library on a rainy night where my mom was like, all right, come on, we'll go get you something from the library to watch. And that was it. This channel sometimes is like therapy for me. I discover so much about myself just from examining old memories, trying to figure out how I came to like this stuff so much. In you go. Seems like we do have some loose ends to tie up in the kitchen here. Remember, we want to get every bit of clutter we possibly can. Don't want to get demoted again. Oops. Uh, where's the rest of the trash? It's more of the stuff on the floor that I really worry about. I've never been able to figure out if, like, stuff that's just in the pantry or on a shelf, if that counts. That's the vibe that I kind of try to get with the readings, is when I'm reading them, even when it's not literally the case, I try to imagine that, like, it's 8 o'clock on a Friday night, just got home from school in third grade, and I'm sitting by the window. That's actually why uh, when my room was redone last year, I literally moved my desk too near the window so I could just kind of visualize that while I'm doing the readings. And it has actually helped a lot. It's the kind of thing where I feel like as an adult, I'm not capable of achieving like true comfort, but I can at least try to approximate it through doing the things I enjoyed as much as possible. You know what, I'm starting to think maybe these garbage cans will be better because at least they stack stuff vertically so everything is pushing down on the stuff beneath it instead of all spread out so there's more opportunity for something with a weird collision to come flying out. 
Uh, it feels like this last hallway has just taken hours and hours. But whilst we are over here, not now. Whilst we are over here, we can get that thing I was talking about that I had gotten lost and thought and forgotten about. And grab ourselves that laser gun. And I'm going to show people, my bosses, that this is how you unclog a drain. Which one was it? Was it you right here? Yes. Now I'm aware that that'll start a fire, right? We'll have to clean up the ash. But it's a lot better than trying to pull out a glitched piece of paper. Boom. Actually, why am I just now figuring this out? What other stuff can we burn up with this? We want to be careful, because sometimes the fire will spread out of control, like that. But it can actually be used for further laziness. Intradesting. Okay, so we don't want to do it to buckets. We definitely don't want to spill any buckets. Wow, okay, that did more harm than good. We won't be doing that again, but science successfully done. Now, what is that thing? The bucket turned into an ash pile. Oh, I get it. It's probably supposed to be a melted heap of metal. Because, you know, it's made of metal and I melted it. Well, we can at least do it with other forms of trash. Such as that piece of wood will probably make a good candidate. Maybe the stone. We gotta try it on everything, because it'll be really useful for coming episodes if I do more of this. Gotta try to avoid doing too much. There we go, you gotta lightly tap it. Pieces of paper will simply burn. Stone, slightly tougher stuff. But everything has a breaking point. Perfect. That could have saved me so much trouble earlier. We should also probably start throwing in these regular buckets. Yep. If they go through the portal, they won't spill. If we try to melt them, they will. But we have to make sure they actually go in. Otherwise, we'll have to risk ourselves to clean it. And knowing this game, I bet it absolutely does count spills beyond the portal as a spill. Mm. Luckily, it doesn't count reaching out as me going in. Yep, some objects, like plastic, you just can't do. Shame, shame, shame. But we do find a little bit more that needs to go away, and our handy-dandy garbage can can help us with that. Just going through and getting the last of this stuff with the sniffer we actually caused quite a few problems for ourselves trying to do this. Oh, that bucket's full. That one is not. And yeah, it's always these last parts, just the getting the last few things that's the most annoying. I'm not going to bother too much with it. I'm just going to kind of try and get through this. We're going to get a decently high score. It's just that, you know, what this game considers to be a high score and what you and I consider to be a high score, it's kind of deliberately annoying. Ah, there's still a whole bunch on the ceiling that I didn't see. Uh, we're at that point where I'm trying to get rid of buckets, but I'm also, uh, I'm also short on buckets. All right, dangerous game. What's going to happen when three buckets with stuff stuffed inside of them are slowly pushed towards the portal? Mm. All things considered, that could have been much worse knowing this game. And we can use that to clean up the ceiling, which should be among the last of the stains we actually have to get. See what I mean about stuff just kind of blending in with the textures? All 
right, then this hallway should be it as far as wipeables. Of course, put the wipeables over an identical pattern that is not wipeable underneath it. That's fine. That's all well and cool. But as this place that's walking always startles me when it happens as I'm walking. There's just some little last bit to get, and then I think we're done. And here we are. And you know what? With that, I'm ready to call it done. It's been over three hours now. I'm finished. So, the impression that I'm starting to get from these horror-themed modded maps is that, on the one hand, they're really cool to see. I feel like they're a great fit for this game because, I mean, sci-fi and horror often intermingle, and that's kind of the inspiration that a lot of the base game mechanics and levels already have. In the meantime, they allow to put a different spin, a different theme, on those same ideas. But I feel like the ones that I've played so far haven't really played to the strengths of Viscera Cleanup Detail, where, uh, of course, it's sort of inherent to the setting that they want to be run down and dingy, but I feel like that takes away from it a little bit in that you don't really feel like you're cleaning it up, just kind of emptying it out. And also, a lot of the features that make it unique, all the scripted events and scares and all that, those are really cool, but they don't account for the fact that you're going to be in this space for hours. At least not in the way that the House of Horrors map did, where there was constantly new things around every corner. And while it didn't have a lot of scripted scares, it did just have a lot of space to explore, a lot of story to get through. Don't want to forget this, that definitely would have lowered our score. But yeah, it, it all kind of makes me have the impression, like, I, I don't think it's really that bad to do all that as a Viscera Cleanup Detail map. But from my perspective, what I'm thinking is, I don't know if this video is really fun to watch. Like, sure, you have the commentary, and you have, like, you know, using it as a springboard to just kind of talk about horror topics. But I'm not sure if watching me clean is as relaxing as I had hoped it would be. Because you don't really get that same sense of progression that I would hope for. Oh, wait, I forgot. I don't care, I'm done, and the Union's got my back. Let's see how we actually score. Demoted again. You return to your office after doing the barest minimum asked of you. Mm-hmm. Okay, so what score did we actually get? 92%. All right, well, I wasn't going to go around for another half hour picking up every little knife and plate. But anyway, if you like this video more than my employers like me, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more creepy and comfy content. If you have any ideas for other videos you think I should do, the best place to suggest that will be at the Discord, which I will link in the description. If you want to try any of this out for yourself, those links will also be in the description. And as always, I will see you in the next one, after I get my payback on management with some of the tools I've acquired over these job sites. <laughs>